Hi, my name is Charles, and I serve here at Transformation Church as one of the executive pastors. And I want to take a moment before we jump into the message just to say thank you, first of all, for watching. It means the world to us that you would be a part, no matter where you're watching from, no matter who you are. I'm believing that this message is going to encourage your faith and hopefully transform your life. If you haven't yet, make sure you take a moment, subscribe to the YouTube channel, not for us, but really for you. We want to be a resource to encourage your faith and be with you on this journey of following Jesus. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Enjoy the message today. I hope it blesses you. Um, the presence of the Lord is in this place today. And uh, I'm a girl from a small town in Illinois that grew up Kojic. So everything that just transpired felt like home. Today I felt God say that today was gonna to be an unusual service. Something different was gonna happen in here and he gave me some instructions on that. But more than that, I felt like he wanted to speak some things that honestly he didn't even tell me before I got up here. And so what I want us to do is just go to God in prayer Sovereign Lord, thank you for being so near to us. Thank you that you are not a distant God, that you are one that delights in the details of our life. Thank you that we are never invisible to you. Thank you that you hear even the softest whisper. Today in this place, we recognize and realize that you are here with us. What we ask of you is to help us carry that presence outside of this place. Help it to inform our everyday lives, our everyday decisions. We're so grateful that you are King of kings and Lord of lords. You sit high on the throne of heaven, and yet you want to meet with us every day. We love you so much. It's in the name of Jesus we pray, and everybody says, amen, amen. amen. Um, Pastor Mike said, my name is Bree. I serve here at the church as chief of staff, and I've been able to be a part of this church for quite some time now. And I first just want to start by saying thank you to our pastor, um, Pastor Mike and Pastor Natalie. Yeah. I want to say thank you because I've been able to witness on a very personal level how you have listened to the voice of God and obeyed. No matter what other people have said or thought. And I've been honored to not only know you as pastor and as my boss, but also as brother and sister. And um, my relationship with God wouldn't look the way it does if you weren't involved in that. And so I just wanna say thank you to our pastors. Love you all, love y'all so much. I was uh, preparing for this message and honestly, this entire message has completely ruined me. And so I'm very excited to share it with you. Um, I realized when I was spending time with God this past week, preparing for this message, he started to show me some things. And um, the first thing he asked me to do was to go to my journal and look at uh, something that he told me 10 years ago. So I went to my journal, I went back to 2013, same day as yesterday, so the 6th of May, 2013, to read what God said to me. And he talked to me about precision. He talked to me about how he was going to give me precision. And that's been my prayer um, coming into today is that God would give me precision. And it's so funny because taking the time to recognize the spiritual giants that we have in the room today, it reminded me of my own upbringing and the way that I was raised. I wasn't raised in Tulsa. I was raised in Illinois. And 
raised in a very small church, but a power-packed church. And I would see my mom and dad get up every single day and spend time with God. Before they did anything else, they got their quiet time and they got alone with God. And I got saved at a really young age. Uh, those of you who grew up Kojic, you probably like me grew up and got saved several times over uh, because you weren't sure if every time you sinned if you needed to get saved again. And so I got saved uh, many of times as a child. And uh, it wasn't until I was 18 that I uh, recognized that I actually wanted to have my own personal relationship with God and really live it out every single day. And I knew that something had changed in my relationship with God because it went from just going to church to wanting to spend time with him in a quiet time, to have what we would call a devotion with him, to actually sit and just be with him, to read the scriptures and to pray and to intercede. And all those things started when I was 18. And God was reminding me this past week that now it's been 18 years that I've had that relationship with him. From watching other men and women older than me and, and my parents showing me what that looks like. And so for the past 18 years, I've been able to have this intimacy with God that has grown and matured for quite some time now. And, and I'm realizing that just because we are believers doesn't mean we actually spend that time with God. And so today in the sermon, I know that God's instructed me to create a space where we can spend that kind of time with God, where we can be still with God, where we can actually stop thinking and caring about everything that's happening outside of this building and just be in intimacy with God. And I'm so grateful because what I know is I can say I've probably been to thousands of church services and conferences and all those different things, and all of those have been initiate, great initiators of what God wants to do in my life, and yet it's been those quiet moments with God that everything that, I tr that transpired in a church service or a conference or an overnight service, we used to have prayer overnight shut-ins at our church, all those things, it was those quiet moments when I bring that moment back to God in my everyday life, that those things, those words that he said were solidified in me. And that in that time with God, he has healed me on so, so many levels. And so today, I just want to talk about what it's like for us to get away from the numbness that we feel with God. And the only way that we can do that is to actually spend time with God. That if any relationship that we have in our life and we want it to flourish and grow and us to get to know more about each other, that it comes from intimacy that it comes from being with that other person. You can be married and not have intimacy with your spouse. You can have friends and not actually have a deep connection with your friends because a title means nothing if you're not actually spending time with that person that you want your relationship to grow in. And so this is something that um, the scriptures call as abiding with God. And the beautiful thing about it is that once we start spending time with God in this kind of way, it starts to inform our everyday life. That abiding, that presence of God comes with us everywhere that we go. We can feel him and we can hear him everywhere we go because we have taken the time to stop our busy schedule and just be with him. and Just sit with him. And honestly, very candidly, it could be very awkward in a culture that champions busyness and champions activity and champions us going and being here and there. And everybody wants to be booked and busy. That's a thing. Like, that's a hashtag. Like, hustle, the hustle culture that we have. And yet God is just waiting for us to spend time with him. He just wants to be with us. And so what I want you to do is I want you to go to Luke 24. And, and let me say that I'm very much so aware and okay that I know this is not going to be an amen message. The entire point of this is for us to be silent and to hear from God. And so 
wherever you may, maybe there throughout this sermon, you may feel a little flutter in you, a little ember growing inside of you, maybe something that you feel like God is speaking to you. It's okay to just hold that. It's okay to just be with that and allow God to minister to you in that. Luke 24, and I'm going to start at verse 13 and go through verse 34. It's a story here called The Road to Emmaus. And we're talking in this this sermon series, it's called King Numb. And we're talking about getting the feeling back in our faith. In Luke 24, 13 through 34, it says, this is the same day that Jesus, that the uh, women went to the tomb and saw Jesus in his tomb, or saw an angel, and they knew that Jesus had been resurrected from his tomb. This is after Jesus was crucified. It says in verse 13, it says, the same day, Two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. They were walking with Jesus and completely unaware that it was Jesus that they were walking with. Verse 17 says, he asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there the last few days. Verse 19 says, what things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, He was a prophet who did powerful miracles, and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning, and they came back with an amazing report. They saw his body was missing, and they had seen angels who told them Jesus was alive. Some of our men ran out to see, and sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, now mind you, they still do not know, they don't recognize that this is Jesus. It says, then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in the scripture. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus, and at the end of their journey, this is a seven-mile journey, Jesus acted as if he were going on. But they begged him to stay. Stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them. In verse 30, it says, as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. And they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within the hour, they were back on their way to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He has appeared to Peter. So this road to Emmaus that they were on, this is a seven mile journey. They were going back home from witnessing what could have been the most tragic day of their entire lives, witnessing Jesus crucified. They had this hope that Jesus was gonna come as a Messiah and that he was gonna rescue them from the Roman emperor, from the Roman government. And what they wanted was a, a king to come and overtake the physical government that they were under. They had no idea that Jesus came to overthrow a spiritual government. They had no idea that Jesus was coming in order to have a new kingdom reign, but it was a spiritual kingdom, not a physical kingdom. And so what was happening was they were walking on their way back and they were sad because it felt like Jesus had been defeated. They had no idea if Jesus had actually risen from the grave or not. All they know is he was brutally murdered. That's all they knew coming out of this and walking back home. And then this stranger comes up to them. 
And the stranger comes up to them, and he's asking them what's going on, and they're like, how do you not know what's happening? And then they explain to everything to this stranger, and then the stranger starts telling them scripture. He starts telling them what the prophets wrote in the Old Testament about what was going to happen to our Savior and to Jesus. And then they, they, they were so inspired from this time that they had with this stranger that when he decided that he wanted to leave, they begged him to stay. Is that not what our relationship with God often looks like? A stranger that turns into an, a teacher, that turns into a friend that you don't want to go anywhere. You just want him to stay with you. What they wanted was Jesus to not leave their side because he had some truth that they needed in their lives. And yet they still didn't recognize that it was Jesus. So what happens? They sit down to eat. And as they sit down to eat, Jesus takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. He blesses it, he breaks it, and he gives it to them. He blesses it, he breaks it, and then he gives it to them. And then their eyes are open. What happened that those people who were king numb at the time, unable to recognize Jesus, all of a sudden became very aware of Jesus, became very aware that they were sitting with the Savior, now, here's the thing about this story. The beautiful thing about our uh, Christian belief is that we know that God wants to be near us. Unlike other world religions where you have to journey to, in order to be close to the deity or you have to do a certain checklist of things in order to measure up to whatever the divinity in that religion says you have to be, God is the creator of the universe. He has done everything that you could ever see in your lifetime. God is the creator of it all, and yet he wants to sit at our dinner table. Yeah. Yeah. His divinity does not, want, does not make him want to separate himself from us. It is because of his divinity that he actually wants to be close to us, that he wants to be near to us. And as believers, oftentimes we are aware of this presence, but we do not adopt this presence. Meaning, I can be aware that God is here, I can be aware that God is in the room, and yet it not change me on the inside. I can be aware that, God, it's like walking into a party and you're aware that somebody's there, but it has no business to do with you. I mean, to know, to be aware, you can be aware of somebody, you can acknowledge somebody, hey, how you doing? You can even be happy to see somebody and accept them, so happy to see them. But just because that somebody is there doesn't mean it's actually going to change the way you show up. The presence of God is not for us to just be aware of. The presence of God is so we can adopt the character of God. When God shows up, everything about God shows up. When God shows up, love shows up. Peace shows up. Joy shows up. Self-control shows up. All the things that God has, grace shows up. And the idea of the presence of God is not to look at it from afar off and be amazed by it, but to adopt that presence into ourselves and actually be changed on the inside. For many years, I said that, that 18 years now, I've had this quiet time with God that's been very consistent in my life. But when I first started this quiet time, it was almost out of, it was out of relationship, yes, but it was also because I knew I, that's what I was supposed to do. And for many years, me and my friends were laughing about this the other day, for many years, I would spend time with God and I would come out of the presence of God, going into my regular day and still be stressed and still be angry. And literally, there have been times where I was married, spending time with God and mad that my husband came and interrupted my time with God. Now, I don't know how I had anger coming out of the presence of the Lord, but I did because just because you're around God doesn't mean that he's actually changing you from the inside out. Coming to church does not mean that you are changing. That intimacy with God, that presence of God is to come and to change us from the inside out. And there are many believers, myself included, that have had years and time with God and yet 
come out looking the same. It's called being king numb. You know the king is there. You're aware that the king is there, but the king has not changed you. You have not allowed that acceptance, that adoption of the king into our lives so much so that it changes the way I talk to my children and it changes the way I talk to my spouse and it changes the way I show up for work and it changes how much time I'm spending in scripture and it changes how I intercede on behalf of somebody else. The presence of God is to change us from the inside out. It is not a theatrical entertainment for us. It is so that we can be changed. Why do we waste our time doing all the theatrics and all checking all the marks off the Christian list and not open ourselves up for God to change us? There's areas in each of us that God still wants to transform. There's areas in each of us, big or small, whatever it may be, that the Lord wants you to adopt his presence, not just be aware of, adopt his presence. And what happened in this scripture is that they were around Jesus, and as he started talking to them, their hearts were stirred. Before even knowing it was him, their hearts were stirred. It said, did not our hearts burn? And as their hearts were burning, they wanted to know more. And as they knew more, it began to change them from the inside out. The beautiful thing about uh, this story is that when they used the, the, the term, did not our hearts burn, it's almost like they had a fire growing on the inside of them. And fire is used in the Bible all the time to talk about the presence of God. Fire is, is, is Moses going up to the burning bush. Now, a burning bush in the desert wasn't a big deal, but that bush was not being consumed by that fire. So he went to go check it out, and when he checked it out, he realized it was God himself in that fire. Fire is what happened when, the, when Elijah went up against the prophets of Baal, and fire came from heaven to consume his sacrifice. It's the presence of God. It represents the presence of God. When the three Hebrew boys were thrown in the fire, they looked into the fire, and there was a fourth person in there because the fire, what they thought was something else, actually represented the presence of God. So when they said, did not our hearts burn, what they're saying is there was a presence that ignited something on the inside of me. The presence is to ignite something on the inside of us. To ignite a passion. To ignite a love. To ignite a grace. To ignite peace. The fire is to ignite something on the inside of us. The title for today's sermon is, Feel the Burn. Do you feel the burn? What areas in your life do you want to feel the burn? God, I don't know how to do this on my own, but I need you to ignite something inside of me that I don't know how to ignite myself. God, I don't know how we're going to rekindle this marriage again, but I need you to ignite a fire on the inside of me that I don't know how to do by myself. God, I come to this job every day, and I am so sick of this job, but you got me here for a reason. If you got me here for a reason, I need you to ignite something on the inside of me that I do not know how to do for myself. God, I know that you said that we are supposed to forgive those that have done us wrong, but I don't know how to do that on my own. Can you ignite some forgiveness on the inside of me? Because I don't know how to do that by myself. God, you said I'm supposed to live with peace that passes understanding, but every single day Today, I am stressed. Lord, I'm asking you to ignite some peace on the inside of me. Today, we are asking God for our feeling back. We are asking God to feel his burn on the inside of us. Today, we are asking God to do something in us that we do not know how to do on our own. We are asking him to light a fire on the inside of us. And when we spend time in that presence, Focus on that presence. That fire is ignited. Jesus captured the attention of these people. 
as he was walking on this road to Emmaus. He captured their attention. Can we allow God to capture our attention? All the many things that we are thinking about, all the many things that we care about, can we allow God to capture our attention enough that he can ignite a fire on the inside of us? To be king numb is to lack the adoption of God's presence, to allow his presence to change us from the inside. Now, when we talk about being numb, it's a term that we use physically in our body. And what happens when it comes to being numb is that there, our whole body is made up of a nervous system. There's nerves running throughout our entire body. It helps us with our breathing, our heartbeat, with our movement, our five senses. All of that is through our nervous system. When we feel numb in our body, when we experience numbness in our body, what is happening is that there is a disconnect somewhere in a nerve. It doesn't mean that the body's not communicating. It doesn't mean that there's not communication flowing through the body. But somewhere there is a nerve that has been damaged or irritated or compressed enough that that communication is not getting through anymore. Spiritually. This is the thing. When we feel numb to God, it doesn't mean that God is not speaking to us. It doesn't mean that God is not trying to communicate with us. There is a disconnect somewhere that is stopping that communication to flow from us. And might, might I say that our busyness could be the disconnect. That our schedules could be the disconnect. That the plans that we made up without submitting them to God could be the disconnect that there's something that's disconnecting us from hearing the voice of God. And it's not until we get still and focused that we can hear that communication again and that we can feel that numbness alleviate. Now, when it comes to physical numbness, there are internal factors and there are external factors. Sometimes numbness happens because there's a disease inside of our body like diabetes or uh, other diseases that can actually create numbness throughout our body. And other times it's external factors like a car accident or some type of injury that happens. And spiritually, it's the same thing. Sometimes it's something just living on the inside of us that stops us from hearing what God is trying to say to us. It's our pride. It's the pride that we won't deal with. Maybe it's the jealousy that we won't deal with. Maybe it's the greed that we won't deal with. It's just something that lives on the inside of us that's stopping us from being able to hear God. And then sometimes it's external factors, like grief and loss. Maybe something's happened in your life, a dream that you thought was going to happen a certain way and it didn't happen that way and there's disappointment. Maybe that disappointment has stopped you from hearing God and has created this numbness. Either way, there is a disconnect. And if we are listening to the voice of God today, he is wanting to point out to us, here is where you're numb. Here is where I've been trying to communicate with you but you haven't sat long enough to allow me to speak to you about that thing. That thing that you've been toiling over, that thing that you've been stressed out about, that thing that you've been fearful of, I've been trying to communicate a message to you. But instead, you haven't focused in on me to hear what I have to say. So how? How do we feel the burn? How do we get to a point where that thing that's numb, that relationship that feels numb, that decision that you made feels numb, how do we get to a place where we hear the voice of God again? Three points, and Pastor Mike said that this already. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through these three points, and as we do that, we're going to actually take some time to allow the Holy Spirit to minister to us in this room. Let me be clear, just because we hear a message doesn't mean we meditate on his word. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the time in here 
to actually meditate on what the Word of God is saying to us in our lives before we go back into our busy schedules and our everyday life to hear what God wants to say to us. So what happened in this story for them to recognize Jesus? Three things. Jesus sat down at their table. He took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to them. The first thing I believe that God wants to, us to know, this is how we get, feel that burn again, is a statement of faith, and it is, I am blessed. Have you ever met a kid, a teenager, let's say, that seems to have the world at his or her fingertips? So completely mom and dad have provided so many things for them, and yet they complain about the things that they want and wish that they had. Instead of focusing on what they've been given, they're looking for the things that they feel like they really want in life, but they haven't gotten it yet. Have you ever met somebody like that? I remember a girl when I was in high school, she had a really nice car, and she would complain about her car, but the crazy thing is, I, uh, as a 16-year-old, drove a 1986 Cadillac. It was my dad's car that he allowed me to drive to school to every single day. And me and my friends actually called it the crap -lack. That was our nickname for it. So when I would hear this girl complaining about her car, I'd be like, are you kidding me? Yeah. All that your parents have done for you, and I'm driving this 1986 boat to school every day. I'm hitting people in the parking lot. I'm using two different parking spaces. All the things, and you got the nerve to complain about the car that you got. And you look and you be like, you're spoiled. Well, that's us. How often do we use our time complaining about and focusing on the things that we want and that we really feel like we need in life without realizing that we are overwhelmingly, abundantly, exceedingly blessed by God? You know, it's like when you spend time arguing with your husband and being upset with him and talking about him to your friends, but being completely numb to the fact that you even have a husband that loves you. You know how you get mad at your kids and like you be talking about how you want them to do this, that, and the other, and then you're so upset with them for the rest of the day, but you forgot that God, you're numb to the fact that God even gave you the ability to birth a child into this earth and that that's the image bearer of Christ in this earth. You know how you complain about a job and you're so upset about your boss and what your boss should be doing and, da -da 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 and all this, completely forgetting that it's that paycheck from that job that actually pays all the bills that you and your family have. We are so numb to our blessings. We are so numb to the fact that every single day we wake up and we have nothing to do with the fact that we're breathing every day. We have nothing to do with the fact that our heart is beating every single day. We have nothing to do with the fact that we have the activity of our lives every single day. We have nothing to do with the wisdom that God has given us to provide answers and, and solutions at our work and our jobs. We are so incredibly blessed and yet we are so numb to the blessings of God. How dare we as spoiled children be upset and complain about the life that God has given us and yet we are surrounded by blessings. We are overtaken by blessings. Every single day, we have nothing to do with the sun coming up and coming down. We have nothing to do with the stars and the moon and the sky. We have nothing to do with this earth rotating all by itself. We have nothing to do with it. We are king numb when we do not recognize the blessings that have overtaken our lives. And when you forget the blessings, it's easier to forget the blessor. You can be numb to the king when you have the audacity to be entitled and spoiled and think that he should do something according to your plan. You can be numb to the king when you don't recognize the blessings every single day you come home to blessings. Every day you wake up to blessings. It's very easy to become numb we don't recognize how blessed we are. I was talking to my therapist the other day. This was the other day, and I'm ashamed to say it. <laughs> I'm gonna lie. 
And I was talking to him about being a know-it-all, okay? I am that, I am aware. I don't need, it. Pastor Michael, I do not need you to <laughs> affirm what I just said, thank you. And I was talking to my therapist and I said, well, here's the problem about being a know-it-all. I actually write a lot of times. <laughs> Any other know-it-alls in the room, you know what I'm talking about. You don't become a know-it-all because you don't know nothing, because you be knowing stuff. And Brent, bless his heart, he just puts up with so much with me. He leans his, his, uh, uh, his whole body up to me while I'm sitting there, and he says, but that's not your wisdom. I said, okay, I'm done for the day. You take this hundred dollars, I'm out of here today. He went on to talk about pride and arrogance and all the things that I needed to hear at that moment. Because the truth is, every right answer I think I have is not mine anyways. Any wisdom that I think I operate in, I didn't conjure that up. That's not something I initiated. That's a blessing from God. Every gift and talent that you and I have, we didn't give that to ourselves. It's a gift. It was something that God gave to us. And when we forget that, we are blessed. We are blessed. There's a quote by a man named Elie Wiesel, and he was a Holocaust survivor. And he said, if the only prayer that you can say is thank you, that's more than enough. I told y'all earlier, I grew up in a Kojic church, and so every now and then, somebody would get up Somebody that didn't have a whole bunch of money, didn't have a whole bunch of stuff, not a lot of materialistic things, really just holding on to the grace of God in their lives. And they would get up for testimony service and they say, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he has done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Let me tell you something. If you take a second and just think about how God has been good to you. I know everything is not like you want it in your life. I know you wish some things were different. But if you just take one moment and think about the goodness of God in your life. That every day you wake up next to your husband, your wife, your children, your job, your money, and your bank account. It may not be what you want, but it is more than enough if all you can say is thank you. just had to stop because in 2016 I was depressed out of my mind so numb to the things of God so unaware of God's goodness because things weren't happening the way I wanted them to happen When I sit and think about, I can literally see myself laying in my bed with no appetite and not wanting to get up to go to work or anything. And the fact that I can wake up with joy, that I can wake up with a smile on my face, that I can wake up and enjoy my actual day is nothing but the goodness of God. It's nothing but the goodness of God. And I can do that, preparing for this message, having to think about God's goodness myself. But I actually want you to sit still for one moment. How has God been good to you? What blessings have you been numb to? What things have you overlooked? 
things that maybe you just feel like, this is kind of just a part of who I am. I'm just kind of a peaceful, tranquil person. Peace is a gift, a fruit of the Spirit. You can't conjure that up yourself. That's something God gives you. What are the things that maybe you've even taken God's credit for? Well, you know, I raised those kids. God gave you the grace to raise those kids. You know, I I got myself into college. God gave you the grace to get yourself into college. What are the blessings In this moment, I want you to just take a second, think about it, maybe even write it out if you need to. What are the blessings that God has given you? List them out. Lord, in this moment, we thank you for your blessings. You don't want to run through this message without stopping to thank you for your blessings. That heart that beats inside of our chest, that's your blessing. The breath that we are breathing, it is your blessing. Forgive us for missing your blessings. We're so grateful for your blessings. Remind us of your blessings. God, we thank you. And we take a second just to recognize the blessings you've placed in our life. The people, the things, things totally outside of our control. The seasons, the universe, our homes, our families, the friends you've provided us with that your son died on the cross for us. Your blessings are abundant and overwhelm us and overtake us if we just take one moment just to think about your goodness. Areas in our life where we've been numb, maybe 
just perhaps because we haven't recognized your blessings. Today in this place, watching online, we bless you back with the fruit of our lips, with our worship, with our tears, with our praise, with a thank you. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. If we could say nothing but thank you, that's more than enough of a prayer. you, God. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Jesus took the bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. After we take the time to recognize that I am blessed, then we recognize I am broken. In this scripture, Jesus is showing us not only that he blessed this bread, but he broke this bread. And here's the thing about brokenness. In the church world, to talk about brokenness can be kind of taboo. One of the reasons why people love Transformation Church so much is because we talk about openly our brokenness. I want to do something a little different today, though. I want, to, I want to take a second to boast in myself. Is that okay? Let me just boast for one. I know that could seem prideful and arrogant, but let me boast in myself. I am a perfectionist. I like things done in a certain way, and if I don't get those things done in a certain way, I get highly irritated. Speaking of irritation, the last couple of weeks, I've been highly irritated with my husband. And him and I have had some beef throughout the last couple of weeks, some things that we need to work out, not mainly because of him, mainly because of me. Because I have an expectation that sometimes I don't say out loud, and when I don't say that expectation out loud, then I'm upset, and then round and round the mirror you go, we go. This is kind of the thing with me. I often care too much about what people think, of me, and sometimes that even stops me from doing things that God's called me to do because I'm too worried about what everybody else thinks. I am struggling right now with my physical body because my husband and I have been trying to get pregnant for over a year and a half now and it has not happened yet. And every now and then, I love my body and then every now and then, I hate my body. I have a hard time being honest about my mistakes and asking for forgiveness from people because I want you to see me in a certain way. And if you don't see me in that way, that means that my identity has been scarred in some type of way. So it's hard for me to apologize sometimes when I need to apologize. <sighs> I've had to talk to God about this because the truth is, I'm trying to decide if I'm gonna get on social media after this sermon or not, because I really like the compliments that come from social media, but I don't like the critics that come from social media. And sometimes I need the compliments to boost me, to tell me I did a good job, instead of really just knowing that God already told me that I did a good job. And so I go to the comments, hoping that I'll see somebody say, my life was changed by what you said. And then I run into a critic who's like, a woman shouldn't preach. And then I'm like, well, maybe I shouldn't preach anymore. And so, I'm just trying to boast in myself for a second. Because Paul tells us that we are to boast in our weaknesses. That the things that people think we shouldn't say out loud, we actually are supposed to boast about those things. Because when I boast about my brokenness, what it does is show you how big my God is. That even in the midst of my brokenness, even though I'm a perfectionist that's often irritable and sometimes has a hard time apologizing, God still wants to partner with me on this earth to bring his kingdom to earth. We belittle God's 
grace when we do not, when we are not honest about our brokenness. It says that the Bible tells us where sin is, that grace covers a multitude of sin. So when I can't say in which ways I am sinful and broken and weak, what I'm trying to say is God's grace is not big enough to cover it. So that's why I can't say it out loud. I belittle God's grace when I cannot be honest about my brokenness. I am a broken woman. And yet I serve a God whose grace covers all of that brokenness. Jesus took that bread, he blessed it, and he broke it. As believers, if we are unable to share our brokenness, we put on self-armor. Similar to how David was going up against Goliath and Saul tried to give him his armor and David refused. But if David were to put that armor on, it would have been what everybody expected. He would look like a real soldier in the army of the Lord. If only he would wear this armor. Armor keeps you numb. The whole intent of armor is to stop you from feeling something. The whole intent of armor is to protect you from something that could be potentially dangerous. And sometimes being able to admit our brokenness feels dangerous. And yet, the reason we can boast in our weakness is because where I am weak, he is strong. I cannot admit where God is strong if I cannot admit where Bree is weak. He blessed that bread and then he broke that bread. What Jesus is asking us is maybe, just maybe, you are experiencing some numbness because you won't admit you're broken. It's easier to armor up. It's easier to pretend like everything is okay than to admit that I am broken and allow God to rest in that place. In all of my perfectionism, in all my irritability, in all the things that I know are broken about me, God rests right there. Could it be that we haven't even given him room to rest because we won't admit the brokenness? Humility is the ability to not only see yourself outside of the, God, the way that God sees you. Humility is to be able to say, God, I need you right here. I don't know how to fix this marriage. I don't know how to stop lying. God, I don't, personally, I do not know how not to be irritated when somebody doesn't do something the way I want them to do. I need your grace. I need you to give me peace in the midst of chaos. I need you to give me love towards a person that I don't know how to love well. God, I am broken. And if we could have the audacity to sit in the presence of God and admit our brokenness, we may feel that burn again. So just how we sat and recognized our blessings, We are going to sit and recognize our brokenness. Every time someone got around Jesus, they go admitting the things that's not right in them. Peter's like, I I, I, I got unclean lips. I I don't want to. Because when you get around the king, how big and how beautiful and perfect he is. It helps you see in which the ways that you need to be more like him. So God, in this place, here we are again. Mature enough, bold enough to sit in our brokenness and allow you to meet us right there. Brokenness is not a sign of defeat. It is a sign of dependence.
Just want you to meditate on that. Maybe even write it down. These are the ways in which I need you, God. Here's my brokenness. God, in this place, thank you for allowing us to be able to admit our brokenness. Thank you that you are not a God that asks us to pretend. You can only heal what we reveal. So as we reveal ourselves to you, God, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your healing power. We are not afraid and not ashamed to admit our brokenness and our weakness. Because when we do, you show up with all might, all power, all strength, full of grace. You rush in where we allow you to see our brokenness, where we admit our brokenness. You do not turn a blind eye. You are not repulsed from our brokenness. You are attracted to it. You want to meet us right there. You want to heal us right there. Thank you. Gracious God, we thank you. In the name of Jesus. Amen. So Jesus took the bread. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave it. And as he gave it, their eyes were open. And they were able to see who Jesus was. Not only do we have to be able to say out loud, I am blessed and I am broken, but I am have something to give. Because here's the crazy thing about this story. The bread that Jesus blessed, broke, and gave to them was the bread that they gave him. That in the midst of all our brokenness, all our blessings, that God is saying to each and every single one of us, but you have something that if you give it to me, I can do something greater with it. So in this place right now, what I believe God is saying to us is give me whatever you have. For Moses, it was a staff. And if he gave that staff to God, God showed up. For Hannah, it was a son. And when she gave that son to God, God showed up. For Noah, it was his craftsmanship. When he gave that gift to God, God did something miraculous with it. What do you have? 
What do you have that you don't think is more than enough? What do you have that you don't think is enough at all? What do you have because God wants it? God wants your yes. If you feel like all you have right now is depression and sadness, give it to God. If you feel like all you have is, God, I just got this little bit of money, give it to God. If you feel like all you have is haters and critics, give it to God. All you have, God is asking, can I have it? When they gave the bread to God, when they gave it to Jesus, and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it back to them, they recognized it's been him all along. The whole entire journey included him. So the question is, what do you have? If God is standing in front of you right now, with his hand out. And he's asking you, just give it to me. There is this practice called imaginative prayer, one way that I remember the presence of God throughout the day, where you can just imagine Jesus standing in front of you. And he's saying something to you, asking you a question. For today, he's standing in front of you with his hand out. And he's saying, just give it to me. What is Jesus asking for from you? Is it the gifts and the talents? Is it your family? Is it the things that you've been stressing over? Is it the things you've been losing sleep over? Is it things that you just have no idea how you're going to do it? God, I, I don't know how I'm going to have a beautiful marriage. I have no idea. God, I don't know how I'm going to get this business off the ground that I believe you've given me. Lord, I know you've been telling me for years I need to write this book. I don't know how. And God is saying, just give it to me. As they gave the bread to Jesus, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it back to them. And when he did that, their eyes were open, and they felt a burn in their hearts. Today, as I close, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you and to me. Areas of numbness where he wants to reside. What's that area for you? As we close out this series, this is going to be something that's going to reverberate in our minds and our hearts as we move on. What's the area of numbness that God is asking you to give to him today? Recently, I've been hearing God telling me, Bri, I want to be more involved in how you steward your finances. It don't got to be no big, audacious thing. It's just something that he said, you haven't fully adopted my presence in this. And I want to take up my space here. I want to ask the worship team to go ahead and come up. And as they're closing us out with this song, there's somebody in this room that even as I've just been talking about Jesus and this encounter with Jesus that these people have had on this road to Emmaus, you are, you're realizing you don't even have a relationship with him. You want a relationship with him. You want to receive that gift of salvation. That's where you've been numb. Your whole life, your whole body has felt numb because you haven't experienced friendship with Jesus. If that's you in this place or you watching online, I just want you to take a moment, even as this song is going forth, and I just want you to say your own prayer to God. Let me tell you what prayer is. It's exactly what I'm doing right now, talking to him. And you're going to confess that you believe God, and you're going to ask him to change your heart from the inside out. That's you in this place. I just want you to take a second, recognize that Jesus wants to give you this gift of salvation, and that it's yours to receive. But what he's asking you to give 
is your entire life. God, today we give you the areas of our life that seem numb, that feel like a disconnect from you. And God, even as we leave this place, this presence that we've encountered, we will take it with us into our everyday lives. We love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Purify my heart. I want to burn for you. Only for you. Take my life as a sacrifice. I want to burn for you. Only for you. A message like that, a message like this, is not something casual. It's something that requires your participation and your yes. And most people come to church to be transactional. Give me an experience, I'm gonna go away feeling good. What you just got out of this message is a responsibility. And truthfully, 
from me all the way to everybody something in that message was convicting you've either been discounting your blessings or you've been too prideful thinking that you're not where you used to be when 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 she started talking about remember you're broken I can think about where I was not just a year ago in some of my thinking and thought process and how God has allowed my brokenness to become something that's so close to me so that I can now be strong in my weakness. Many of us even in this room today, we've not taken the time to give what we have away. Well, they got to value what I have. They better pay me. They better do this. They better do that. And God's saying, I need you to come back and give me what I've asked you for. Last thing Bree said is giving your whole life. And many people, I love it. And I, I'm going to just say it because I'm the pastor of the church. People were in tension this whole service. As soon as there was a moment for people to leave, they left. And I'm not saying maybe some of them had an emergency, not 500 at the same time. It's because it's the awkwardness of sitting and waiting on God. We're ready for an explosion. God, do something dynamic. God, and he said, I will speak in a still, small voice. If you make room for me, I'll speak to you. It's not going to be with the band and the lights and all that other stuff. He said, we love singing wait on the Lord until we have to do it. It's our favorite song, it's on the playlist, but it's not in our practice. And at Transformation Church, we gonna put you in that tension. If you don't feel like this at some point in your daily devotion, I don't even wanna be here no more. But something in me saying God's gotta still speak. Today I'm asking us to take a step of maturity as a church and realize those three things. Everybody say, I am broken. <laughs> Woo, I am blessed. And I have something to give away. No, you need to say it again. I am blessed. I am broken and I have something to give away. Just one more time with faith. I am blessed. I am broken. I have something to give away. Father, in this place, I thank you that you spoke through your servant. Something that is not just for a moment, but something that we will come back to over and over again. If you're in this room and you did what Bree asked, or you're watching online, and at the end you said, I want to give my life to Christ. I want to give my whole life to him. That's the thing I have to give. Today, we want to rejoice with you. And there are some people that didn't even recognize that that was your moment. Today is your day of salvation, if that's you. This is the reason our whole church exists, to see people far from God come into loving relationship with him. If you're in this room or watching online and you're saying, I want to give my life to Christ. This is your moment. And at Transformation Church, we're a family. Nobody prays alone. So if you're in this place, there's a bunch of people who was as raggedy or raggedier than you were. And we came to a loving savior who did something to pay the penalty for every sin that we would ever have. And today, it's your opportunity to come into the kingdom of God. On the count of three, if that's you in this room or watching online or watching on rebroadcast or watching at any moment, standing in the lobby, picking up your kids, and you know today is the day that you are giving your whole life to Christ. On the count of three, I just want you to lift your hands. Church tells you you need to confess everything to us right now. But the Bible tells us, according in Romans 10, 9, that if we that believe what Jesus Christ has done and repent from our sins, we are saved. Today, as you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, we believe that God is doing an eternal transformation on the inside of you. And everything has led to this moment. This is why the church is praying right now. This is why there's a war in heaven going for your soul. It's because this decision is going to change everything. And today, we're going to stand with you. If that's you, 
on the count of three, lift your hands. One, you're making the greatest decision of your life. Two, I'm proud of you, but forget that your name is going to be written in the Lamb's Book of Life for all eternity. Three, with faith, shoot your hand up in this place. Shoot your, I see you, my brother. I see you, my sister. Online, I see you. God sees you more than that. Can we pray together? Just everybody say it out loud. Say, Lord, thank you for burning in me. Today, I give you my life. I repent from sin and I turn to you. Today, I'm asking you to take my brokenness and to turn it into something beautiful. I believe you lived, you died, and you rose again to give me power to live like you. Today, I'm all yours. Change me, renew me, transform me. I'm your child for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we rejoice in this place for all of those people who are burning for him? Oh, I said, can we rejoice in this place? Thank you, God. You're about to get your feeling back. I don't, I don't know what's about to happen, but you're about to get your feeling back. I'm going to ask the worship team to just play for a little bit. I don't want everybody to come up here laying hands on people. Today, if you need God to touch you, ask him. I, I, I want you to know the atmosphere is already set. Because at home, you're going to have... The only one that you need, his name is Jesus. So let's practice. They're going to just play and you need to sit, you need to meditate. If you need to go, I love you. Next week, we're going to be here starting a worship series. Three o'clock, the tickets go on sale for Transformation Car. You know all the things you need to know. But if you need God to continue to do something in this moment, I want you to let him do it. Amen. For everybody that's watching online, I love you. I want you to go out and live a transformed life. Let's give God one more shout of praise in this place. Hallelujah. Hey, I want to take a moment again before we jump off and say thank you. Our church is not built on one individual, but on the sacrifice of so many. And you being a part, it means the world. So thanks for watching the message. I also want to say thank you to the thousands of people around the world who are generous. It means the world. And we are able to represent, we're able to be generous, to meet the needs of people because of your giving. If you haven't taken the step to give, trust me, there is no pressure at all. But if you feel led, you can text the word GIVE to 828282 82 or you can go online. When we partner together, God uses our generosity to make a difference. Again, if you haven't, take a moment to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And more than watching on YouTube, join us on Sundays. Every single Sunday we're here, 1045 CST AM. We would love to see you. And like we always say, go out and live a transformed life.